Our families sing to us, hoping we can hear. Our loved ones pray for us, taking away our fear. And as we stand by the older kids up above, they let out a breath. We can all feel the love. National Indigenous Peoples Day is a day for us to celebrate who we are, that we are still here, and that we've overcome so many of the problems that our people have gone through. Hello Canada, I'm Janella Massa. Joining you at a new time, beginning tonight, we'll be on air with you for two straight hours through the rest of the summer. This evening, we're bringing you special coverage in honor of National Indigenous Peoples Day. It's being celebrated from coast to coast to coast, but there are also tragic reminders of this country's treatment of First Nations still weighing on the national conscience, and that's what we're talking about in Canada tonight. It's a significant day for us in terms of celebrating our long, arduous struggle to gain some sense of recognition in a very racist post-colonial society. Key themes this year focus on how Canadians can be better allies and the importance of passing on Indigenous culture. But of course, the conversation isn't complete without acknowledging the discovery of the children's remains at a Kamloops, BC residential school last month. I thought it was important to use the color blue to represent the spirits because in our lodges we are taught that we come from the stars and, the st and that, that color is blue and when we're in those lodges our spirits appear as blue orbs. So these are 215 orbs and each one is a fingerprint. The Stand Strong Children Mural in Selkirk, Manitoba is dedicated to the legacy of residential schools. A section was recently added to mark the remains found in BC. It's one of the countless examples of Canada's cruel treatment of First Nations and one that will play a significant role in our discussions here over the next two hours. Let's talk about what this day means for Indigenous people after weeks of renewed tragedy. Let's bring in Crystal Gale Fraser. She's Assistant Professor of History and Native Studies at the University of Alberta. She's Gwichia Gwichin and joins us from Edmonton on Treaty 6 homeland of Métis Nation. Hi, thanks so much for, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, hi, hello. It's great to be here tonight. So Crystal, tell us a little bit about, about the history of Indigenous Peoples Day. For sure, a uh, very thoughtful question. Um, it actually started out as National Aboriginal People Day, and this was made uh, a special day in 1996. And this actually goes back to calls that was made starting in 1982 by the National Indian Brotherhood, now known as the Assembly of First Nations, followed up by renewed calls in 1995 by RCAP, or the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And it was recently changed in 2017 to National Indigenous Peoples Day. And here in 20, 2021, we are celebrating its 25th anniversary. Right. And, and so how is this day typically marked? I mean, we mentioned there that things look a little bit different this year, partially because of the pandemic, partially because of things that have happened in the news. But typically in previous years, how is this day marked and celebrated? Definitely widely celebrated with all sorts of communities uh, here in Edmonton on Treaty 6 Métis homeland. There would be round dances, there would be outside festivals and feasts, there would be opportunities to engage, um, engage in all kinds of cultural activities. Over the past year we've seen a lot of that move online to online powwows, online round dances, online feeding courses, even cooking classes on how to make bannock and so I think that in this COVID world we're really learning how to still maintain that sense of community still celebrate together but uh, in a safe way according to public health regulations. Obviously though this year is uh, you know has a bit of a somber mood attached to it given the the recent discoveries in the last couple of weeks and that's just one of actually a number of different stories uh, having to do with indigenous communities uh, you know dealing with injustice tragedy how is that impacting how today is being marked For sure I mean the news out of Kamloops uh, Kamloops a few weeks ago very tragic, very uh, sad, heartbreaking. 
but definitely not surprising, unfortunately, to a lot of Indigenous communities. We've been grappling with the trauma and the loss around the Indian residential schooling system for decades now. And uh, in a lot of cases, you know, families knew that their children were missing. The, there were never any explanations offered. Um, as I spoke about on other formats, residential schools could manipulate their records and so these student deaths wouldn't be on file. But communities uh, and our families have, have known these things for a very long time. However, it is another thing when your sadness and your loss is, is really launched into a national spotlight. And so I think for today, for this uh, national Indigenous Peoples Day. The mood is is still somber. We are still in mourning. We are still um, holding up our our family. We are still talking about these things. And so, even though it's it's still a really good day to celebrate our cultures, to come together, there is still a level of, of heaviness present in our communities as we try and look after each other. Mm. And. To, if non-Indigenous uh, people want to take part in this day, what do you recommend they do? Whether it is uh, celebrating uh, Indigenous culture and learning about it, but also uh, wanting to take action in, in some of these injustices uh, that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. For sure. And I really encourage everyone, all Canadians, to get involved in this day, I think education is is key to understanding the issues, but also working forward towards reconciliation. And so, you know, look up the 94 calls to action made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The last updated number I heard uh, a couple of weeks ago was 12 of the 94 calls to action have been implemented. I co-authored a piece in response to Canada 150 now four years ago called 150 Acts of Reconciliation, which is meant to engage everyday Canadians a little bit more with their families um, rather than a large government institutional approach, which, you know, frankly can be a little bit daunting and intimidating. But the point here is, is that we're in this era of, of reconciliation. I hope, particularly after the, the news out of Kamloops, that this will mark the next era in reconciliation where we can really start to work together in a meaningful way. Right. And this is where everyone really has to be involved in this. And so if you're feeling left out, if you're feeling like you don't know, that's okay. Take a chance. We're, we're all going to make mistakes with each other. Um, but the point is, is that we're doing it with each other together. Crystal Fraser, Assistant Professor of History and Native Studies at University of Alberta. Thanks so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, in light of the revelations over the past few weeks, more Canadians are asking, how can we be better allies to Indigenous people? Well, 16-year-old Isabel DeRoy Olson has some answers. She's an Indigenous actress, dancer, and contributor with CBC Kids News. Whenever there's something going on in the news about Indigenous peoples, it seems like I'm usually the one that my friends and sometimes even teachers turn to for answers. I got the chance to talk to two experts about what exactly Indigenous allyship is and how we can all become better allies. I'm Larissa Crawford and I am an Afro-Indigenous activist. My name is Cindy Blackstock and I'm a member of the Good Sand First Nation and I work at something called the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. What is an ally? Someone who uh, stands with you uh, in the realization of your rights. So when you see an injustice in the world, even if it doesn't affect us, because we know that if there's injustice in the world, then it really isn't living up to humanity's full potential. What are some other good things that people can do to be good allies? We need to be taking action if we are to be demonstrating allyship. It can be looking like supporting your peers, going to protest, writing a really cool project, and researching and, and becoming more aware of what different people face, different people's realities, and how you can support them. But sometimes allyship is uncomfortable as well. So it may look like having difficult conversations with your friends, maybe with yourself. Why be an ally? I didn't tell my friends I was Indigenous when I was in school. 
because I heard all of the awful things they would say about Indigenous people, not knowing that I was Indigenous. As you explore this idea of allyship, I really encourage you to let go of your preconceived ideas of who Indigenous people look like. What would you say to someone who doesn't think allyship is worth it? I would say that, um, you know, it, it, if, you do, if you can't relate to the word allyship, think about it as being your friend or your neighbor. And to realize that it doesn't cost you anything. And joining me now is CBC Kids News contributor Isabel DeRoy Olson. She's a citizen of Trondequichin and also from Lake Manitoba and Ebb and Flow First Nations. And she's in North Vancouver tonight on slay uh, territory. Hi, Isabel. Thanks for being with us. Hi. So, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about why you wanted to do this story about allyship. Why was it important to, to touch on that topic? Right now, I've been seeing a lot of posts online, whether it be in the news or on social media, regarding Indigenous peoples, mostly talking about residential schools and MMIW G2S. And with that, I've been getting lots of questions from friends and even teachers about how they can be of better support, what, asking what can I be doing and how can I be a better ally. And so tell me, what did you take away from your conversations with, with Cindy and Larissa? Yeah, so I talked to two experts, Larissa Crawford and Cindy Blackstock. Um, something that Larissa said that really st stood out to me was, allyship is more of an action, it's not a noun. It's something that we do and not something that we are. Mm. And something Cindy said was, if you can't relate to the term ally, it's more of just being a good friend or a good neighbor. And she also mentions that we have to take initiative and learn about that injustice, even if that injustice doesn't directly affect us. They both also mentioned that allyship has really made a difference in their life and work. And I can definitely say the, say the same for myself. Mm. Yeah, how do you think those conversations will impact how you approach, uh, you know, your relationships with, you know, with your friends differently? I feel like from those conversations, there were definitely three key points. And firstly, being just being open to listening to Indigenous voices and uplifting those voices. And secondly, being open to learning, educating yourself, taking that action. And finally, just overall, just doing the best that you can and just trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I think sometimes people are afraid that they're going to say the wrong thing. So they'd rather say nothing. Do you think that's a mistake to at least try to do the right thing? I feel like definitely after talking to both of our experts, I feel like you definitely have to take initiative to learn and then to take action. So taking that time to educate yourself and learning about what the right thing you have to say is. And there's never going to be a perfect ally. Mm. So just trying and just being there for Indigenous peoples, I think, is really important. And before we and go, let me ask you, you know, we're joining, you're joining us on Indigenous Peoples Day, and I've been asking some of our guests what it means to them. What does Indigenous Peoples Day mean to you? To me, Indigenous Peoples Day is really celebrating our culture as Indigenous people because that culture is so diverse. And just honoring and recognizing that diversity and the contributions we as Indigenous people make in Canada. Awesome. Isabel DeRoy Olson is a CBC News contributor and a citizen of Trondek Wetchin. She's also from Lake Manitoba and Ebb and Flow First Nations. Thanks so much for chatting with us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, political leaders are also lending their voice to the day. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau releasing a statement to mark National Indigenous Peoples Day. It reads in part, while today is a time to celebrate Indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast, it's also an opportunity to acknowledge that there's much more work to do on the important journey to reconciliation. He went on to acknowledge the horrors of the residential school system, saying sorry for these tragedies is not enough. We need to right these past wrongs and address ongoing challenges, and we can only accomplish this with action.
New Democrat Party leader Jagmeet Singh also shared his feelings on the day, reaffirming his party's commitment to getting justice for Indigenous people. For so long, Indigenous people and their culture and their language have not been celebrated. In fact, have been actively um, discouraged and have been, have been uh, suppressed. So it is so important for us to celebrate. Today is also a day where we've got to really recommit that not only should we celebrate Indigenous people, we've got to fight for justice for the first people of this land. Well, one Indigenous MP is calling out the feds on what's supposed to be a day of celebration. Mumulak Kakak is the NDP MP for Nunavut. She made headlines last week for her farewell address to the House of Commons, calling out the government's inaction on Indigenous communities. And she joins us now. Hi, Mumulak. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. And first, I just want to personally apologize because we reported last week that you were resigning, but in fact, you're just not running for re-election. So I just wanted to make sure we clarify that for our audience. Uh, I want to first ask you what Indigenous Peoples Day means to you. As you said, today should be a day of celebration, but how are you feeling? Thanks for having me and the space and being so quick to respond to that and bringing that up. Media is so influential in our lives. And, you know, I think of the commercial that says you want to talk to everyday Canadians as opposed to politicians. And I'm trying to promote that politics can look, feel and be different and real people can fill these spaces. So mm. I'm glad we get to continue the, the conversations for sure. I think there's a shift happening in Canada. I think Canadians are starting to realize that there is a history uh, for Indigenous peoples, ultimately a Canadian history here that is dark, uh, unpleasant, uh, has led to a lot of uh, turmoil, a lot of violence, a lot of poverty. And when we think of in celebrating Indigenous peoples and culture and, and that diversity, what are we really celebrating? What are we really looking at? And I think that it's another day for an opportunity to discuss the failures of the federal institution. Mm. Over the past uh, week, you've been talking a lot about the reality of what it's been like for you in Parliament, uh, sharing stories about being stopped by security, feeling like you're constantly in survival mode, like you're not well, it's not a space where you are welcome or safe. And also the impacts on your mental health and on your relationships. What has the response been like since you started sharing your experiences so publicly? I think the most important thing to note is that this is a very public example on a very a, a big scale, if you will. But this is something that happens and has happened for Inuit and Indigenous people for, for decades. This is a magnifying glass on the actual issues that all too often Indigenous peoples faced, uh, are faced with here in Canada. And that comes from a lack of uh, lack of education, a lack of awareness, being able to fuel assumptions and stereotypes. Ultimately, the federal institution, it benefits uh, the federal institution to keep this history, to keep this Canadian awareness that coming from to full light. Uh, I think having me, uh, having the room to have been fortunately elected and, and bring these new, not new realities, but to bring more realities on this kind of level, I think, is something that is the first time for it to be happening. But it's not, this isn't new. This isn't anything shocking. Uh, quite frankly, the only people it's shocking to are white people. Mm -hmm. This isn't shocking to anyone that's Indigenous, anyone that's Enoch, anyone that's a minority. It's just a, it's a very big example uh, in a very public position. Mm, and I think that might be why it resonated with so many people, uh, because it's an experience that they could relate to, but on a much uh, smaller scale, which didn't capture, doesn't capture people's attention. You talked about um, the pushback that you've gotten in trying to make change. And one of the examples you talked about was the difficulty, uh, you know, trying to make change with your housing tour. Uh, you know, you saw many things on, on that tour, moldy homes, generations crowded into a room, and you brought that information back to Parliament. Parliament. How frustrating was it to get the reaction that you did or lack of? I mean, again, it's what we hear from the House of Commons all the time is that this isn't new information. We heard Mark Miller himself say that there were other members that had the similar experiences that I did when it came to security. And it's taken 
Uh, it's taken quite a bit for me to really wrap my head around the fact that I'm surrounded by not just dozens, but almost hundreds of people who willingly uphold systems and have direct opportunities to make change, and they really don't. Uh, we saw on PROC committee last week, I was trying to get uh, Bill C-19 amended so that it could include Indigenous languages on the ballot. All we were trying to get the PROC committee to do was find it in scope, so meaning that they would at least discuss it on the committee. They mm -hmm. wouldn't even discuss it on the committee. And you could see clearly the members that knew it was important, knew I was right in what I was saying, and still were towing party line and being told what to do and, and following that. I think Canadians, uh, especially now that we're unfortunately talking about election have an opportunity to really push agendas and and people that benefit canadians as a whole as opposed to the rich and wealthy elect more people like me although i might not be running again i think it's it's so important indigenous people get involved in politics and if that's what they want to do i'm just saying for me it's it's i will finish this term as strong as i came in and have proved that and uh, plan on doing so until the end of it. And I'm just deciding not to run again this time. Uh, but I don't think and don't mean to imply that it's not ever a space that Indigenous people can be in because we have to create those. Uh, you can say the same thing about Canada. You can say the same thing about many of our systems as a society. But we still are here and we still can make space and belong here. Well, that was going to be my question, uh, what your advice was for young people who might be considering politics and maybe shy away from it, hearing just how exhausting the experience was for you. Do you feel like it is a space where uh, people of color, Indigenous people uh, who want to make change uh, can? Are you hopeful that that can happen? Absolutely, and I think it's a lot more helpful to go in more mindful. I definitely didn't totally um, consider really the 360 of the colonial house of, on fire I was walking into. And in that, I, I wish I had taken more time to find those really grounding aspects uh, of my life and what that relates back to. And mm -hmm. It's being able to find that support, find your group, find your, your comfort. And if politics is something you want to do, absolutely get into it, go for it. And I would love to support any young, any any you know, any Indigenous peoples along along the way. I'm just saying it's not for me, Mumila. And I hope that I can show, even though if even though it's something that. I've decided it's not for me. I've shown Canada that impossible is possible and there can be hope where it's purposely put out even even in in these kind of situations where it doesn't seem like there's a, a light or a hope. We have to create that. We have to continue to thrive and strive to be as strong and resilient as we can and show other people that that we can do it and we can fill these spaces and be truthful along the way and and that's all i'm trying to do and and show people that you can as long as you put your mind to it all right mumala kakak is the ndp mp for nunavut she's in ottawa tonight thanks so much for taking the time and uh, we wish you all the best on your next endeavor and we'll be watching take care matna well, we've been talking about National Indigenous Peoples Day, but Canada Day is just around the corner. And while celebrations have already been scaled back by the pandemic, the apparent discovery of the remains of more than 200 residential school students in Camp Loops, BC, has some rethinking or outright cancelling previously planned festivities. CBC's Erin Roman spoke with some local leaders. Take a look. Canada Day is usually a big deal in La Ronge, Saskatchewan. But this year, the celebrations are on pause. It's about the children. It's about the children that didn't make it home. The reported discovery of children's remains at the former Kamloops Residential School has shaken the nation. And celebrating this country's complex legacy didn't feel right to some. The 215 children um, didn't, have a, a, you know, didn't have their parents to be there when, before they passed or what, not knowing what happened. 
And then the parents not having a say or not having a voice uh, to be able to put closure. Other communities have also decided to cancel events on July 1st, including Victoria and Penticton, where a local Indigenous leader made a request of the city's mayor. Chief Gabriel also made a note that if we were to cool down uh, the celebrations this year, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. The local nations are, are really uh, reeling and, and, and grieving, and it just seemed uh, the respectful thing to do. St. Albert, Alberta is cancelling its fireworks display, which have always happened over the grounds of a former residential school. And Prince Edward County in southern Ontario will do nothing. When we took a step back, the reality was is that we were grieving. Ottawa's celebrations are mostly virtual because of the pandemic, but they are still a go for now. It should be revisited, but in a positive way. I don't necessarily think that people need to cancel their celebrations. I think it's important for us to stop, to reflect, and to, to take in the, the impact of that. Something that must happen, she says, before we can move forward. Erin Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Welcome back to Canada Tonight. Today, Canadians are celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day. But June 21st is also traditionally the beginning of St. John's Day, a festive period marking colonization in Newfoundland and Labrador. But as Chris O'Neill Yates reports, starting this year, the city of St. John's won't be celebrating. As of this year, St. John's will no longer celebrate St. John's Day's beginning today, June 21st. Instead, the city is encouraging people throughout the city to celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day. They say that the whole idea of discovery, that John Cabot arrived here in 1497, that there's not been the recognition that ought to have been given to Indigenous peoples here, that that must come to an end, and it comes to an end with the city. So St. John's Days would be celebrated throughout the week, but they're encouraging people to get involved in Indigenous Peoples Day and the week-long celebrations that are happening here throughout the city. Maggie Burton is a city councillor in St. John's and she explains why the time has come to just move St. John's Days to another time so that it doesn't conflict with National Indigenous Peoples Day. We have like a very Eurocentric culture and a history of, um, you know, in St. John's of celebrating St. John's Days and discovery and the concept of discovery, which is just not true. This is being welcomed by Indigenous groups in the province. Stacy House is the executive director of First Light. That's an Indigenous group here in St. John's. There are, by the way, about 7,000 Indigenous people living in the city. And she says this is something that they had been hoping for ever since the province signed a declaration with them to make the city more inclusive. Here's Stacy House. We have a vibrant and strong culture that needs to be celebrated. You know, there's a lot of education that needs to be done, a lot of awareness, but there's also a lot of beauty in our culture and just a day to recognize our culture by, you know, practicing drumming or different ceremony. And we encourage others to celebrate with us. So the celebrations for National Indigenous Peoples Day start today, but there are a variety of programs and events that they're encouraging everyone in the city to come out and enjoy, to educate themselves a little more on Indigenous culture and be part of those celebrations. And of course, this is part of the city's commitment to the declaration it signed a number of years ago with the Indigenous peoples of this city to make the city more welcoming and inclusive. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Well, this year's celebrations of National Indigenous Peoples, they are especially poignant because of the recent discovery of the remains of hundreds of children at the site of a former residential school in B.C. CBC's Kelly Ewan has more on how the day is being marked in the greater Toronto area. This year, like the last, many events are being held online. We're giving thanks to, uh, through the fire, we use the sacred fire, Instead of gathering at Nathan Phillips Square, the city commemorating the day with a virtual guided explanation of the sunrise ceremony. What they represent is the 13 moons. Indigenous Peoples Day Month is a chance to raise awareness of the history of the land, your history, all of our history. It also coincided with the official grand opening of the Mount Dennis Aboriginal Child and Family Services Centre. 
this center is one step, only one step, but it is a step, a significant step in the right direction. The center, like the one already established in Malvern, will focus on the cultural needs of the indigenous community through programs and services developed by them. Not only did they want a space where they could bring their children to come and learn, they wanted ceremony, they wanted culture, they wanted land, they wanted youth services, they wanted food security. Today's events also a time of deep reflection as the country undergoes a reckoning with the discovery of children's remains at a former residential school in Kamloops, BC. It's a stark reminder of, of Canada's colonial past. In the city's West Donlands, a celebration to mark the groundbreaking on Ontario's first mixed-use Indigenous hub also carried a theme of reconciliation. By not forgetting that our collective hearts shattered and trembled upon learning about the findings of the remains of 215 Indigenous children. The hub will be the new home of Anishinaabe Health Toronto and include an employment and training centre, a daycare, family services, as well as rental apartments. This project was framed as a reconciliation project. It's about placemaking as well. Uh, many of the cultures in the city, of course, uh, have a place, locations, in, in terms of their communities. And now we have one. We're here to, uh, I guess, celebrate uh, a step closer to a dream that started many, many years ago. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. To Halifax now in the renaming of a park many say was long overdue. The park once bore the name of Edward Cornwallis, the controversial founder of Halifax, but is now officially named Peace and Friendship Park. CBC's Colleen Jones explains. Elder Danny Paul is pulling down the tarp with Mayor Mike Savage to reveal the newly named Peace and Friendship Park. It's an emotional day for Danny Paul. He wrote the book, We Were Not the Savages. In it, he added to the conversation that Halifax founder Edward Cornwallis was no hero. Rather, the cash reward he offered in 1749 for Mi'kmaq scalps was barbaric. He's been fighting for this change, he tells me, for 35 years. He had to educate people and uh, begin to bring the hidden history out of the closet and put it on the table. Until I wrote We Were Not the Savages and exposed the scalp proclamations where they were never discussed. As a matter of fact, some historians were saying that the uh, relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the uh, uh, British was a, a very cordial one, which in fact it never was. Mi'kmaq. This day was momentous for many. Throughout. On behalf of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, I thank everyone who helped make this happen. I know it was quite a process. It was quite a process. There were protests, vandalism, and finally a black cloth draped over the divisive statue before Cornwallis was taken down and hauled away. Um, this has been a contentious thing. I mean, I can tell you, there's, there's few things that have, uh, I have had more people tell me we were doing the wrong thing than to take down the Cornwallis statue and to rename the park. But I think today people get it. But now the Cornwallis name and statue are officially gone from the park. Reconciliation isn't just one event, it's multiple things that lead up to it. And it's doing all of these things as treaty people to acknowledge our culture and our history. That's so important. So for me, this is like a huge step for our, our Indigenous community in here in Halifax. To me, it's an outstanding step for ourselves, the Mi'kmaq, and an outstanding step for Nova Scotia and Halifax. This isn't just for Mi'kmaq, this is for all of us who live here um, and who have to share this land and recognize the history of it. Uh, but more importantly, turn our gaze to the future and make it better. And that future includes this, the Peace and Friendship Park. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. My next guest has made immense contributions when it comes to Indigenous issues and calling for change. Natan Obed is the National Representative of Inuit in Canada. He's also the President of the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, and he is Inuit, and he joins us in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Hi, Natan. Thanks for taking the time to be with us tonight. No, happy to be here, Janaa. So let me ask you first what today means to you. First and foremost, National Indigenous Peoples Day is really about the celebration of 
First Nations, Inuit, and Métis in this country, and just our incredible cultures, societies, and communities, um, our language, uh, our relationship with the land, uh, our families, and uh, just the fact that we're still here, that we can celebrate um, living in a wonderful country, but also living in a specific Indigenous society. So I think of it first and foremost as a celebration. Mm. Yeah, you know, typically, as you say, a, a day to celebrate your culture, your language. But of course, this year, you know, these celebrations are happening on the backdrop of uh, some really difficult uh, stories, one being the, the yeah. discoveries in Kamloops, but really so many others, uh, and, and capping off years and decades of injustice and hardship uh, for Indigenous communities. How does that impact how you mark today? Well, I can't help but think of Bill C-15, uh, the piece of legislation meant to uh, implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples here in Canada, and then think about the things that we've talked about on the national level, uh, not just this month, but over the past 10 years, whether it's murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, residential schools, um, you know the finding of the remains of of 215 children in mass in a mass grave in in BC. All of these speak to uh, the idea that Indigenous peoples did not have human rights in this country. And so I think about what we are doing now, that um, to implement uh, Indigenous peoples' rights, which are human rights in this country, and. I, I can't help but think of both sides of that. The absence of and violation of human rights against Indigenous peoples led to the things that we have to go through today in reconciliation, and then the upholding of our Indigenous peoples' rights, which are human rights, leads us to a better future here in this country. You talked about uh, the passage of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of, of Indigenous People and, and some of the steps towards uh, uh, change. So a lot of your advocacy has also been around the environment and around sports. It's another conversation that we have a lot on the national level, right? The names of teams and, uh, you know, Edmonton's CFL team uh, changed its name. As you start to see some small steps uh, of changes of things that, you know, you have been working towards and others as well, um, do you start to feel like there is very slowly a shift happening? I think we'll take um, every single positive piece of momentum we can and recognize we are still living in a society with a great injustice, with a violation of human rights and systemic racism. Even if we are living in this space, there are more allies. There are more people and institutions and governments that are focused on making changes so as that the future isn't the same as the past. And something um, such as the very contentious issue of indigenous mascots in North America has changed year over year and we're seeing more and more um, Canadians, Americans, people who uh, support um, professional sports, collegiate, university, junior sports, all coming to this recognition that indigenous peoples are not mascots. And that to me is another sign of change in this country and it's something that is it should be celebrated as a part of what it means um, to be an active part of reconciliation in this country right let's talk about that word we hear it a lot reconciliation what does that mean to you and what would you like to see to be able to say that's how we achieve reconciliation well, it's an action word in many ways for me, and it, it isn't something that one institution can do for another. It is just an ongoing way in which uh, we need to act and realign the way that we see the world um, and the way that we respect the human rights of uh, First Nations and Métis in this country, and also the way that we um, end systemic racism upturn systems of oppression and uh, policies and legislation that systematically um, create 
the the realities that we were trying to push back against the socioeconomic challenges that we have. But in the end, it's also can be a place of celebration that Canadians can be, um, you know, celebrating First Nations even in Métis success and self-determination and the upholding of human rights um, alongside as allies for us and with us instead of uh, in the past where it was um, a very one-sided approach to it, whereas you know, um, many Canadians felt like they could make decisions for Indigenous peoples rather than with Indigenous peoples. Natan Obed, uh, happy National Indigenous Peoples Day to you. <laughs> Natan Obed is the Hi. president of the Inuit Tapirit Kanatami. Thanks so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Well, for many in Canada's north, this Indigenous Peoples Day is marking another kind of history, falling just days ahead of the 100th anniversary of the signing of Treaty 11. It's a treaty that still has a lasting impact today. Treaty 11 was the last of Canada's numbered treaties with First Nations. It covered nearly a million square kilometres, mostly in Northwest Territories, but also parts of Yukon and Nunavut. The terms of the treaty have had ongoing legal and socioeconomic impacts on Indigenous communities, and historians describe, describe big disagreements and broken promises. As such, many of the signatories of Treaty 11 have also been involved in the modern treaty process, some of which is still being ne negotiated. And for more context on this history and where we go next, we bring in Dennis Nakeko. He's one of our contributors here on Canada Tonight. He's a member of Lidley Quay First Nation, which is part of Treaty 11 territory and a founding member of the cultural group Dene Nawo. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for uh, being with us again. Good to see you. Hey, Janela. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And, and happy Indigenous Peoples Day to you as well, because as I, we've been talking about, today really is meant to be a day of celebration. But we are talking a, a little bit uh, about history today. So I want you to take me back. We, we talked a little bit there about this treaty that was first signed 100 years ago. But for people who aren't familiar, can you kind of give us the Coles Notes version of what happened then? Uh, yes, I actually just referred to my Coles notes, so I'll refer back to that. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, Treaty 11, it's uh, something that happened 100 years ago up here in the north. Um, I think what's really important when we're talking about treaty is how it's linked with resource extraction. I think that's um, really important when we talk about this context, uh, especially uh, who controls the land and who gets to say what happens on the land. In 1919, oil was discovered in Norman Wells, which oil is still pumping from there. <clears throat> and after that, in 1921, that's when treaty was made between the Crown and Dene and Métis people up here in the Northwest Territories. Um, but that link, I think, is really, really important because uh, that link when it comes to land, when it comes to extraction, and when it comes to the treaty making process, it seems to be, you know, the emphasis from the Crown side. Prior to that, the Dene wanted to make a, a treaty, wanted to have agreement with the Crown, but the Crown wasn't having it until oil was discovered in 1919. Mm. And then two years later in 1921, treaty was made. And uh, it's an example of something of nation building, I think. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, the contributions of indigenous peoples here in this country. Um, I got to correct that. There's actually, there would not be any country if there was in, no treaties out there. Right. So treaties are actually the foundation of this country. Without those documents between sovereign nations, uh, I don't think we'd have this country as we know it here in Canada. Right, and so there was a moment, obviously, they, we have these treaties, but uh, the government's actions weren't matching up with the promises that were being made. So uh, how did, when did the Dene start noticing this, and, and how did they respond? Well, the treaty-making process is not a new process here for the Dene. Uh, over 300 years ago, I think, is when the Dene and the Cree made peace in Alberta, it's called Big Peace River. It's called Peace River now. North is Cree territory. <clears throat> I mean, south is Cree territory. North is Dene territory. But they can live and share the land. So that was uh, one one treaty. Here with the Dene, amongst the Dene, we had the Klicho and the Dene Klene with Edzo and Akecho, and they made a treaty. They used to fight over the land, but they made a peace and friendship treaty so both groups can share 
the land. So that that idea of a meeting of the minds, of making an agreement uh, over a disagreement, that wasn't anything new. Actually, the Dene were quite good at it and quite skilled at that. The only difference is that there was a piece of paper involved in it uh, from the Crown's perspective. And it's kind of weird because the whole document was already written before it left Ottawa to go into the territories mm. for negotiations. So there's always been some discrepancies over the printed word and over our oral tradition as Dene people. Um, in the past, right after Treaty 11, there's been a number of court cases, the Berger Inquiry. Uh, there's a lot of things that happened in the North that really changed the course of the whole country. Uh, and Treaty 11 has to do with that. One other case, the court allowed uh, oral tradition to be um, put as evidence in the court. And that was the first time that ever happened. And that oral tradition was based on the knowledge and the stories, the living memory of the elders that were alive during the making of Treaty 11 in 1921. So not only are we nation building, we're actually changing the course when it comes to the political landscape when it comes to treaties and modern treaty making processes. And for me, I think it's kind of a hopeful thing. I think it's a, a way for our country to kind of go in the future because, uh, you know, we've been here for over 150 years and it seems like all we have is problems and issues. <laughs> right. And, and this was going to be the last thing I was going to ask you because, you know, Northern nations did eventually, as you say, start re renegotiating some of these some of these treaties and some of those are still uh, going on uh, with land claim agreements. But what can we learn uh, from uh, Treaty 11 today? Uh, we can learn a lot. I think we can learn, if we look at the past, Canada can learn what not to do with Indigenous peoples. I think Canadians can learn a lot about that as well, too. But you have to think, you know, Canada, uh, we just inherited this government from the United Kingdom. It's a Westminster, Westminster parliamentary system. Uh, it's based on very violent past. You know, the House of Commons have to be two broadsword lengths away, because back in the day, they used to take their swords out. And they have a ceremonial mace to keep the order. But back in the day, that was actual mace. So someone who was out of order, they were like, boom, you're out of order and out of life, next order of business. So <laughs> that, that's the that's the history of this colonial government. And the landmass for the United Kingdom is kind of like this. But if you look at the landmass of Canada, we're like, we're huge. Right. So how is this government that works on this landmass going to work over here? Plus, if we look at Great Britain now, you know, they have Brexit, some issues with the European Union, the originators of this government. Uh, it's not really working out for them now. Uh, what makes people think that we can do it over here as well, too? So I think the way is through the modern day treaty process. Up here, we have the Clicho government. And from my perspective, that's the most Canadian government we have because it was negotiated by the federal government and territorial government, Canadians and indigenous people, Clicho. They have a meeting of minds and they created a system of government that actually makes sense for the people that actually live in that area. So from mm. that definition, in my perspective, the Clicho government is the most Canadian government we have. And I think this is one way, an avenue, I think we can go to if we can work together, that uh, we can actually create system of governments that actually makes sense for the people that actually live in this part of the world. And I think that's through treaties and that's through our relationships with Indigenous peoples. Denizit, it's always good to chat with you and we appreciate the history lesson. Denizit Nake Ko is the founder of Dene Watnawo and he is in Yellowknife tonight. Thanks so much for your time. Masi Cho. My next guest is the first Indigenous woman to be House Leader of any legislature or parliament in Canadian history. It's currently Manitoba NDP MLA. She was instrumental in organizing Canada's second national roundtable on murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and recently was recognized with an Inspire Award for her work in public service. Nahani Fontaine is Ojibwe from Saguin First Nation. Hi Nahani, thanks so much for being with us tonight. I mean, thank you for having me. So let me ask you first what this day means to you. I've been asking some of my guests that. What does National Indigenous Peoples Day mean for you? Yeah, well, it's certainly one of the best days of the year if you're an Indigenous person. But, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, every day should be National Indigenous Peoples Day as the original peoples of our territories here across, uh, you know, from coast to coast to coast. It's a good day. It's a, it's a day to celebrate Indigenous peoples. It's a day to feel empowered as Indigenous people. 
it's a day for Canadians to move towards reconciliation. If there are any days that Canadians should be making an effort to educate themselves or stand in solidarity with Indigenous people or lift up Indigenous peoples or support small businesses of Indigenous peoples, today is that day. Overall, it's just a, a pretty great day. Yeah, and you know, as much as today is a day of celebration, we've been talking about how, um, you know, it's happening in the shadow of these events of this year. But the events of this year aren't new because you've been working and advocating for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls for a long time. And you were actually honoured, as I mentioned, uh, for an Inspire Award because of that. Can you tell me a little bit about that journey and what you learned about the resiliency of some of these communities? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's important to know that Indigenous people, specifically if we're looking at the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Two-Spirit, Indigenous families have been fighting for their loved ones well before it became uh, on the national scene or in the national consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the most earliest cases of MMIWG2S are found along the Highway of Tears in the 1950s. I've met some of those families. And from that time, 1950, those families have been trying to seek justice within the judiciary and the you know policing institutions across the country. And, you know, it's a long journey. They're the ones that have brought us to this moment in history where we, you know, if you ask, I would suggest the vast majority of Canadians, they would know or have had heard of MMIWG2S. So families, first and foremost, have led uh, Canada to where we are. Uh, and, and, and then, obviously, Indigenous women. Indigenous women have been on the front lines alongside families fighting for the right for Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited to be safe, to be, you know, safe walking down the street without being propositioned, to be safe, you know, on going anywhere and you're not stolen and you're not murdered. And so this has been long-standing, a long-standing issue and a long-standing fight and struggle. And what I will share with this is that if you ever want to learn or see or experience um, forgiveness and resiliency and courage and strength and commitment and dedication, it is when you work with MMIWG2S families, because I have never met people in my life that are more dedicated and committed to their loved one and are so forgiving and generous and loving at the same time. They are really the quintessential examples of phenomenal human beings. And, you know, more often than not, they're not given that credit or that due or that recognition. You know, speaking of uh, resilience and courage, uh, you're also someone who exemplifies that because you're one of the first Indigenous women to be the House leader of any legislature or parliament in Canadian history. Uh, you know, last hour we spoke with uh, NDP MP uh, Mumala Kakak, and she's been very vocal about the struggle uh, to be an Indigenous woman and Inuit woman in that position. I, I want to know from you as well, you know, if you echo that sentiment, and also what's your message to young Indigenous women who may want to follow in your footsteps in a career in politics? Yeah, let me just say that I 100% support and stand alongside Mumalak. Everything that she put on the official record is 100% truth. And it's a truth that is not often highlighted uh, or shared or spoken about because, you know, the procedures and protocols and rules uh, of, of any legislature across the country, you know, those have been nurtured and developed over generations by men. And so the practices of the House are, are men. It, in many respects, and I've said this more often than not, it is, it is a, a space of toxic masculinity in which that is allowed to reign supreme. And so if you look at even just the architecture of legislatures across the country, more often than not, there weren't even women's bathrooms. And they were not designed with women in, in, in mind. And they certainly weren't ever considered that women would be occupying those same spaces with men. But imagine that as an Indigenous woman mm. or an Inuk woman, right? You, th those spaces were even doubly not made for us. And so you come in, you're elected, you're duly elected, 
uh, and you bring in with you all of your experiences and your expertise and your culture. And indigenous women, no matter where you are, at the heart of our, the core of who we are, we are matriarchs. And so we bring that in those chambers with us. And there is a lot of resistance to that. There's a lot of resistance to indigenous women in those chambers challenging all of the isms, racism, sexism, whatever you, you want to call it. There's a lot of challenge. And those spaces can be brutal. They can be absolutely brutal. It's, and, and it's my job as one of the few indigenous women elected across the country to make sure that it is a space that it is not, that's not brutal or harmful or violent to the women that are coming after me. And so that's why I, I go hard in the chamber. Like I will call those things out because we have to create a space where women, indigenous, black, uh, women of color are safe to participate in our democratic processes. It's not easy though. Nani, I wish we had more time to chat because there's so much more that we could talk about, but we appreciate the conversation. Nani Fontaine is a Manitoba NDP MLA and 2021 Inspire Award recipient. Congratulations on that, and thanks so much for being Thank with you. us. Miigwech. Thank you. It's a traditional art form in the Inuit community. Throat singing can mimic the sound of birds, the wind, the river, and many other things. A mother and daughter team are now sharing its beauty and significance with people across the country. <laughs> Shina and Caroline Novalinga have taken to social media to introduce Canadians to throat singing and to other aspects of the Inuit culture. And I'm joined now by Shina Novalinga and her mother, Caroline. Hi to both of you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Thank you for having us. Shaina, I'll start with you because you've been sharing different parts of your Inuit culture on TikTok before you even started with the throat singing. So why did you want to do that? And uh, tell me a little bit about, about how that started. Yes, I love every aspect of my culture, but throat singing has definitely taken a big part of who I am. And um, we all started this last year and we haven't stopped since. We've been practicing a lot lately. So it's been really fun, a really great journey. Yeah, Caroline, tell me a little bit about the significance behind throat singing. It's something that you do professionally and you've been kind of teaching your daughter and, and she's been taking us on that online journey. Tell us a little bit more about the significance of it. Um, <clears throat> throat singing is, um, usually done between uh, two women so um, it's it's a way of connecting uh, to each other and um, I'm also teaching her how to I mean uh, to uh, connect with our ancestors and yeah yeah, and I understand part of what is so special about continuing on in that tradition is that for a long time, it was actually banned, that you couldn't. And, and there were few people who actually knew how to throw, throat sing in your community. Yes, exactly. We were told not to throat sing. It was considered a sin, but it's something so beautiful. And we want the whole world to know that it's... It's beautiful, it's sacred, it's important for us to, to keep. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what the reaction has been like. We've been getting so much love from everyone around the world, uh, from indigenous peoples, from non-indigenous peoples, and they said that it helped them heal, it helped them grieve uh, with their grieving, and we're so glad to, to be helping people. I think that's what really touches our heart and that's what keeps us going. And Caroline, what's it like to be able to share this tradition, not just with your daughter, but with a larger audience? I mean, some of your videos have millions of views. Um, it's important to uh, pass down the traditions to our younger generations. Um, we've been getting messages from young people saying that they feel good from uh, with their own skin, they're proud to be uh, um, indigenous. So I'm really grateful to be able to uh, share it with everyone. And 
to get so much support and love. Yes. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing journey. Shaina, as I mentioned, you don't just do throat singing on your TikTok account. We just saw some videos there of you sharing different parts of your culture, uh, some of your different foods and clothing. Um, tell us a little bit as you're joining us on Indigenous Peoples Day. What does this day mean to you? This day is really important to us because we are celebrating and honoring our people, Indigenous peoples, uh, have contributed so much for the land, for the environment, for thousands of years. And, you know, we are very resilient and strong. We want people to know that and appreciate us for who we are, who we've always been, and not the stereotypes that's been circling for years. We really want people to know us for who we are. All right, Shaina and Caroline, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us here on Canada Tonight. And we're going to give you a chance to share some of your throat singing with us and sing us out to break. Uh, Shaina and Caroline, this is The Little Puppy. There's a large mural in Selkirk, Manitoba that's dedicated to the legacy of residential schools. And recently, the artists who created it have added a new section. It marks the discovery of what are believed to be the remains of more than 200 children buried at a former residential school in British Columbia. Artist Jeannie Red Eagle is project leader for the Stand Strong Children mural. We're standing in front of the finished, the finished piece of Mashka Wigabuad, Abanujiag, Stand Strong Children mural. And this is to commemorate the history and legacy of the residential school. You know, it's, it's been a long time coming. The journey has been hard. Um, it's been emotional. Um, and it's been healing. So what we did is we created this, the 215 spirit orbs representing each, each uh, child that was found. I thought it was important to use the color blue to represent the spirits because in our lodges, we are taught that we come from the stars and, the st and that, that color is blue. And when we're in those lodges, our spirits appear as blue orbs. So these are 215 orbs and each one is a fingerprint. Because there's a lot of people that don't even know that these things happened and that they were been happening recently. It's pretty, it's pretty unnerving, but people should know about it. It's definitely been an enlightening experience to get to be a part of something like this. I mean, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, telling a full story about something that deserves to have light shed on it, that cannot be denied now that it is in story form as big as it is, it's been amazing to be able to do that. Well, that is it for us here on Canada Tonight. Thanks for joining this conversation on this special edition celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day. 